Hello. Health science through our partnerships, calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's second Young EDC Scientist Showcase, YES, webinar, which is titled Endocrine Disrupting Chemicals and Met Metabolic Disruption. Our moderator today is Sarah How Howard, founder and manager of DiabetesEnvironment.org. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A session. You may type, type in questions through a Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, our moderator will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period, and we'll fo follow up on unanswered questions after the webinar. For those of you who have called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download those by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is the link to the slides. Everyone in the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. The webinar is scheduled to last for 60 minutes and is being recorded for our Kong webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Hannah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Again, it's on EDCs, Endocrine Disrupting Chemicals and Metabolic Disruption. And um, like Hannah said, we're, this is the second in our series sponsored by this HEADS Mentoring Working Group, which uh, we made this as an opportunity for early career scientists to present their research. If you want to sign up for us with the future webinars, you can go to HEADS.org and sign up for the newsletter and we'll announce them there. So today we have two speakers and we'll have each speaker go and followed at the end by a question and answer period. Our first speaker is Chris Kosotis, PhD. He will be an assistant professor this fall in the Institute of Environmental Health Sciences in the Department of Pharmacology at Wayne State University in Detroit. He's currently a postdoc in the Nicholas School of the Environment at Duke where he researches how chemical mixtures in house dust may affect the risk of obesity. He earned his PhD at the University of Missouri, where he looked at oil and gas fracking as a source of EDC exposures and the health effects of exposures. Our second speaker today is Raquel Chamorro Garcia, PhD, who, as of today, has been an assistant professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz, for exactly one year. She completed her PhD at the University Autonoma of Madrid in Spain, and then held a postdoc at the University of California, Irvine. Her lab researches how environmental stresses like EDCs affect how genes function. She's specifically looking at how exposures during early development affect metabolic health and how these effects also appear in subsequent generations, from children to even the great great grandchildren using mice. So we're going to start with Chris, and I think he is ready to go. Uh, thanks, Hannah, and thanks, Sarah, uh, for the introduction. Uh, I want to thank all, all the folks at CHE, uh, HEADS, and, and our young EDC uh, scientist group uh, for providing me the opportunity to come and, and share some of the work that I've been doing uh, with, with you all today. Uh, so I've been a postdoc now uh, at Duke for the last five years. Uh, and as Sarah said, I'm transitioning now into an independent faculty role that I'll revisit at the end of the talk. Uh, and so I wanted to share some of the very cool research that I've been working on here at Duke um, and some of the future directions and, and new research questions that I'll be asking going forward. So uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this data. Uh, the incidence of obesity uh, has grown to pretty alarming levels, um, both in the US and globally. Uh, so currently about 40% of the U.S. adult population is now categorized as obese uh, and one in 10 infants and toddlers and one in five to the 19 year olds. Uh, and these children will have a much greater likelihood of uh, staying obese as they age. Uh, you can see on the top right how these trends have, have changed remarkably over time, uh, over a relatively short length of time. Uh, and I think it's also important to note that these are um, population level estimates. Uh, and there are clear racial and socioeconomic differences um, as well in these rates. Um, 
these, uh, the instance of obesity uh, contributes to a really high burden on our, our healthcare system. Uh, so several hundred billion in US healthcare costs. Uh, this is more than 12% of the total healthcare expenditures in some uh, US states. Uh, and this is due in part to the fact that uh, obese individuals have an increased susceptibility to other um, comorbidities. So things like type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and others. Uh, and while most of what I've, I've shared here uh, has to do with the US specifically, um, this is a global problem and rates are climbing in most countries around the world. Uh, and this is despite growing attention and countless intervention programs, which have really produced only modest effects in most cases. So the idea that environmental chemicals could be playing a role in this uh, was first suggested in this 2002 publication. So importantly, this paper summarized decades of experimental evidence that were available at that point in time. So the author challenged caloric intake and activity as insufficient to account for the magnitude of the change in obesity prevalence and genetics as insufficient to account for the rate of the change. They also summarized the wealth of available animal evidence on chemicals like antibiotics, PCBs, plastics, pharmaceuticals, and other chemicals that have all been demonstrated to increase weight or fat mass in animal models. So there are a number of mechanisms that through which environmental contaminants can disrupt metabolic health. Chemicals can influence which cell lineage a precursor cell develops down. That is to say, whether it develops into a fat cell or a bone cell or a muscle cell, et cetera. Uh, they can shift energy balance to favor caloric storage, alter the hormones controlling appetite and satiety, and more. The two mechanisms that I will primarily focus on today are shown in the red box. Um, and that is the increased, uh, increased fat cell proliferation uh, and increased lipid or triglyceride accumulation. So if we start this process of fat cell development with a multipotent uh, precursor stem cell, um, this is a precursor cell that can develop uh, down several pathways, right? So this can develop into a fat cell, but also a bone or other cell types. So the next step down that developmental pathway is to these fat precursor cells. Uh, so these are cells that are committed to the fat cell lineage. They can't develop into other cell types at this point, but they're very early in development and require a signal to develop further um, fully into a mature fat cell. So this is the stage that, is, uh, that most cell models target. And activation of several of these early stage markers, such as uh, the nuclear receptor peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma, or PPAR gamma, uh, can push development forward. As that occurs, the cells change from, from this initial kind of fibroblast uh, morphology shown at the top, um, undergoing morphological changes to more of a spherical shell, uh, uh, cell type uh, shown on the bottom right, and they start to accumulate triglycerides around the periphery of the cell. As they become mature uh, fat cells, these lipid droplets coalesce and become a large central droplet that displaces the nucleus and eventually resembles uh, what we think of as a um, mature uh, white fat cell. Importantly, while PPAR gamma is, is often considered the master regulator of this process, activation of other receptors can promote this process as well, including disruption of the glucocorticoid or thyroid receptor. So before I get into results, I want to uh, explain our cell system a little bit more clearly. Uh, so we use 3T3L1 cells. So these are committed fat precursor mouse cells. Um, so they cannot develop into another cell type at this point in time, but they do require a bit of a further push to develop into a mature fat cell. So this model is really well understood. Uh, it's been used for decades now. Uh, and so we, we well understand the mechanisms involved in driving the development of a mature fat cell. Uh, and it's proven quite reliable, uh, particularly when coupled with assessment of underlying mechanisms like PPAR gamma uh, in predicting in vivo or whole organism responses. Some limitations are that it, it is about a two week assay, uh, which is a little bit lengthy on the in vitro side. Um, the cells have a limited uh, lifespan or, or usefulness 
Uh, and it fails to incorporate some of the other mechanisms that can contribute to metabolic disruption um, that I talked about previously. Uh, right, so in general, our assay timeline looks like this. So it's about a two week process. Uh, we take the precursor fat cells, we plate them into 96 well plates, let them grow to confluence or where uh, they're fully covering the well bottoms. Uh, this is a trigger for the cells to undergo growth rust and revert to clonal expansion. After that time, we can uh, give them a further push down the differentiation pathway um, by treating them with what we call a, a differentiation cocktail or a mixture of chemicals. We also start treating with our test chemicals at that point in time, uh, and we do that for 48 hours. Uh, at that point in time, we switch to an adipocyte maintenance medium uh, and continue our test chemical exposure for a further eight days. Uh, and so then at the end of that two weeks, uh, we then test for triglyceride accumulation as our marker for differentiation using the Nile red fluorescent dye, um, which partitions into the lipid droplets and fluoresces, uh, as is pictured here on the right. Um, and then uh, for cell proliferation using the HESHT uh, DNA dye, which is shown on the, on the bottom right. Uh, and then just to give you an idea of what this looks like in my hands, here's... Um, a figure of cells treated with rosiglitazone. So this is a Keepar gamma agonist, often used as a positive control for these assays. Uh, and you'll see a number of cells. Um, the blue staining is our, our nuclear DNA stain. Uh, and then the yellow is our, our now red um, triglyceride stain. All right, so uh, the cohort or so, some of the work that I want to share to you today is, is through this small North Carolina cohort that we've had going in our group. Uh, so this, this is the Cancer in the Environment or CIE cohort. It's a group of about 140 participants from Central North Carolina. Um, and we collected information from them via questionnaires and medical records, and then also visited their homes to collect indoor house dust um, for use in the experiments that we'll describe here. Uh, the dust was sieved to remove the large particles, uh, solvent extracted in the lab, and then the extract was then split for one mass spec analysis. Uh, so this is where we're measuring the organic contaminants present in the dust, and then two for bioassays. Um, so this is then uh, activation or inhibition of specific molecular pathways uh, and the ability to promote fat cell development. So indoor house dust is a, is a well-described sink for all sorts of consumer product chemicals. Uh, the chemicals leach out of many of our products and materials in the home, uh, are brought into our home on our clothes or groceries, and are applied by us as ingredients in a lot of uh, personal care products. Uh, all of these chemicals eventually find their way into our, our household dust. Uh, and, and researchers have measured concentrations of hundreds of different chemicals in dust, uh, Non-target efforts report 10,000 or more chemicals. Uh, previous work has shown that the mixtures of chemicals present in dust can activate or inhibit specific endocrine hormone pathways at low concentrations. And importantly, people are going to be exposed to these mixtures via chronically via multiple exposure routes. All right, so we tested these extracts of household dust in our 3T301 uh, pre-adipocyte or precursor uh, fat cell assay. Uh, and we saw a range of activity across the dust samples. So on the left-hand side, you'll see our solvent control sample. So this is uh, dimethyl sulfoxide. Uh, this is the kind of the carrier for all of our test chemicals. Um, and so in this case, you'll see really no differentiation. So our, our nuclear blue DNA staining, so you'll see the cells stain there. Um, but you'll see minimal or no uh, triglyceride or yellow stain. Uh, in contrast, right next to that, you'll see rosiglitazone. This is our positive control. Um, and you'll see a, a number of cells that are accumulating triglycerides. Uh, and then I've put in just a representative two different dust extracts um, demonstrating kind of a range of different activities by, by different dust samples. Uh, and so most of these dust extracts in the study uh, exhibit, promoted pretty significant activity. Um, more than two thirds um, accumulated triglycerides and then, then also um, about two thirds uh, promoted significant proliferation of, of these cells. And that happened in a couple ways. So here you'll see the sample responses um, 
exhibit kind of a range of different phenotypes, right? So each curve here is a unique dust sample uh, tested at a range of concentrations. So some of these samples exhibited a high degree of triglyceride accumulation and also exhibited a high degree of preadipocyte proliferation. Um, so triglyceride accumulation will always be on the left and proliferation will be on the right. Uh, there's another set of samples that exhibited a high degree of, of triglyceride accumulation, but really minimal or no uh, proliferation. And then we also saw the inverse, where certain cells exhibited minimal or no triglyceride accumulation, but a high degree of proliferation. And then, of course, we had that subset of 10% of the samples that exhibited neither activity. So one of the big questions that we were interested in asking here was uh, which of the hundreds or thousands of chemicals present were contributing to the mixture-induced effects on fat cell development? So here we tested a range of flame retardants uh, found in the dust uh, and found that concentrations of them in the dust were strongly positively correlated with the extent of triglyceride accumulation induced by those dust samples. Interestingly, though, few of these were independently active in this model suggesting either uh, co-occurring contaminants were actually promoting these effects, or there were some mixture effects going on that we weren't appreciating. So we've been further sorting this out in another cohort in Central North Carolina, uh, where we have chemical concentrations for more than 120 different chemicals, uh, and through um, some statistical approaches to look at mixture effects uh, with Dr. Kate Hoffman at Duke. We also evaluated associations between the extent of dust-induced effects on fat cell development and the health of the residents living in those homes. Uh, we found positive relationship between uh, the dust-induced triglyceride accumulation and the thyroid-stimulating hormone concentrations in the people living in those homes, and a negative correlation with uh, serum thyroid hormones, so T3 and T4. Uh, so this suggested to us that there might be a role for thyroid hormone receptor inhibition as a potential factor in, in these effects. We also performed regressions, controlling for things like sex, age, race, education as potential confounders, and found a significant association between the extent of um, dust-induced fat cell development in our cell model and the body mass index of people living in those homes. So to say that another way, uh, the greater the extent of dust-induced fat cell development in our cell model, uh, the greater the BMI of the, of the adult living in that home. So we, we wanted to further evaluate this link um, to thyroid hormone receptor inhibition. So we've shown that activation or inhibition of, of a number of different pathways can promote triglyceride accumulation in our model. So activation of the glucocorticoid receptor in green or PPAR gamma in blue both promote robust effects. But inhibition of the thyroid receptor beta also promotes a significant degree of triglyceride accumulation, shown uh, circles here on the left. Uh, through work with Dr. Aaron Collitz in our lab, um, now out at Cal EPA, uh, we also evaluated all of these dust extracts for their ability to inhibit uh, the thyroid receptor. So shown here on the right is a strong positive correlation between the extent of thyroid receptor antagonism or inhibition and the extent of triglyceride accumulation induced by these, these dust extracts. However, we wanted to determine a more causal role for thyroid receptor uh, inhibition in these effects. And so we selected uh, a set of dust, uh, subset of dust, dust extracts and, and performed two kind of additional clarifying experiments. So the first one um, we would think of as what we'd call a ligand recovery experiment. So the idea here is if thyroid receptor inhibition is what's driving the effects on triglyceride accumulation, we should be able to counteract those effects by adding in a thyroid receptor activator. So in this case, we co-treated our cells with the dust extracts, but also thyroid hormone, T3. Uh, and we witnessed a significant reduction in the dust-induced triglyceride accumulation by these, these samples. Uh, we also performed a, an siRNA uh, knockdown of the thyroid receptor and, and exhibited and saw some of the same effects as we saw with the, with the ligand recovery experiment. So really demonstrating that thyroid receptor inhibition is a contributory role for some of the effects that we're seeing. Okay, 
So I want to, to talk a little bit about some of the, the chemicals that we've been evaluating. So one of these classes that are being routinely observed in household dust and are also found at high concentrations in things like municipal wastewater are these ethoxylated surfactants. So these are high production buying chemicals used widely in laundry detergents, uh, hard surface cleaners, paints, and other consumer products. Uh, and we tested a variety of what we call alkyl phenol ethoxylates. So these are chemicals like the well-known toxicants, uh, nonyl phenol and octyl phenol, uh, and they have a varying length ethoxylate chain um, shown here on the bottom. Um, and these have been in use for decades now. Um, and we also tested a range of the alcohol ethoxylates, and these are the supposedly more environmentally friendly replacement chemicals uh, that have been gradually replacing a lot of the alcohol phenol uh, applications. And so here we varied the base chemical structure of these surfactants. So uh, we tested alcohol phenols like nonyl phenol and octyl phenol, and then also some of the replacement alcohol ethoxylates. And all six of these induced a high degree of triglyceride accumulation, shown again on the left, and four of the six promoted proliferation. Uh, notably, I'd just point out that these are quite active. Uh, nonyl phenol in red and acetyl alcohol in blue uh, promoted greater triglyceride accumulation than even our positive control, rosiglitazone, uh, and very strong proliferative responses as well, although at higher concentrations. Um, but we next wanted to determine whether it was the base chemical or the length of the ethoxylate chain uh, that was driving this activity. Uh, and so here we selected a single surfactant, uh, nonyl phenol ethoxylate, and then we varied the length of that ethoxylate chail, uh, chain or tail um, from zero, which is just the base chemical, nonyl phenol, up to a chain length of 20. And you'll see that the medium chain length compounds had the greatest activity. Um, which you can see better when graphing activity by chain length, uh, which is shown here on the right. So we actually observed an inverted U effect uh, where no ethoxylate chain exhibited a moderate degree of triglyceride accumulation, which increases with as the chain length increases and then decreases after about six to eight. So I wanted to give you a brief idea of where this work is going from here. Uh, I'm now funded through a K99 R00 from NIEHS uh, to further explore this group of chemicals. Uh, so first I'll be exposing zebrafish during development and assessing how this might impact uh, fat cell development and growth trajectories. I'll also be more fully evaluating the underlying molecular mechanisms uh, through which these contaminants might be inducing these effects. And then lastly, I'll be evaluating a causal role for these contaminants in the total mixture induced effects for some select environmental samples. And so I want to take just a minute and say, so why zebrafish, right? So zebrafish are actually a really great model for endocrine and uh, metabolic health research. Uh, nuclear receptors are highly conserved across vertebrates, meaning we can examine chemical effects in a fish with a high degree of translation capability to humans. More importantly to metabolic health, the mechanisms underlying fat cell uh, and lipid depot development are also highly conserved, including things like energy storage and morphology of adipose tissue, uh, genes associated with differentiation of fat cells, and even the control of adipose distribution in the distinct depots in the body. Uh, adipose tissue in the fish is, is composed of a heterogeneous subpopulation similar to mammals, uh, and zebrafish, importantly, are extremely amenable to high-resolution full-body imaging, which is, is often not the case for, for a lot of uh, mammalian models. So Dr. John Rawls here at Duke has done a lot of work to characterize the 34 regionally and morphologically distinct zebrafish adipose tissues. And on the bottom right is some of the work they've done characterizing the developmental timing of these various depots and the growth of the fish. Now this work is still ongoing, but I wanted to give you a flavor for what this work provides. So on the top, uh, here's a fluorescent image of a developmentally exposed zebrafish. Um, so this, this fish was exposed during embryonic development to 0.1% dimethyl sulfoxide or DMSO. This is our solvent control. Uh, exposed to Nile red at 30 days. And then the whole body imaged for, for the fluorescent fat cells. So you can see a pool of adipocytes, primarily in the pancreatic visceral and abdominal visceral adipose depots. So these are the first two depots to develop in zebrafish. And you can contrast that then uh, with a fish exposed to one of the monophenolophoxlates. 
So this is just one set of representative images, um, but you can clearly see an exacerbated uh, adipose phenotype in this fish. Beyond the adipose depots already observed in the control fish above, you'll see adipose developing in a number of other depots throughout the fish. Uh, and so I don't have finalized results to share on that quite yet, but I hope to have more in the coming months. And so just to, to wrap things up, I wanted to, um, hopefully I've communicated that some common environmental contaminants and mixtures can disrupt metabolic health in our cell model. And that often can occur at environmentally relevant concentrations. We have some evidence that some of these mixtures might be promoting effects through inhibition of the thyroid receptor, but we still have work to do on that. Uh, in many of these mixtures, the causative chemicals uh, still need to be identified. Uh, and there's a need for new tools to do that. Uh, and then lastly, there seems to be an association between the dust-induced effects on fat cell development and the metabolic health of residents. I want to stress that that's not necessarily causative. Uh, this could also be a measure of something like altered behavior, where individuals who are already overweight or obese uh, bring different products into the household, which drives a different uh, chemical burden in the dust and subsequent effects in our cell assay. All right, so with that, I, I want to bring this to a close. Thank Heather Stapleton uh, for her incredible support over the last uh, several years and the rest of the lab for their support and encouragement in getting all of these things done uh, and for their help on, on some of the projects that I shared today. Uh, also here at Duke, Lee Ferguson, uh, regular collaborator at K99 Mentor and has, has spent a lot of time on these surfactants that I talked about. Uh, for the last year, I've been uh, working with Dr. Seth Coleman at North Carolina State um, getting hands-on training and experimental support with the K99 zebrafish experiments. Uh, and then also Tamara Tall as well has provided, uh, has provided some invaluable feedback um, in getting these, these experiments going. Uh, and I should, should point out uh, su ongoing support uh, through NIEHS. And so the last thing I want to say before we transition over to Raquel um, is that I've accepted a assistant professor position at, in the Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and Department of Pharmacology at Wayne State uh, starting in September uh, and I'll be recruiting at all levels uh, and so please feel free to shoot me an email if you're interested or if you know anyone who might be um, and uh, with that I will turn things over to Raquel. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Um, great presentation, a lot of information there that's very useful for, for your audience. While we're waiting um, for Raquel to pull up her slides, I would remind everyone you can put in your questions now. We're gonna hold a Q&A session at the end of the webinar after the second presentation, so after Raquel's. Um, so feel free to start asking your questions now and we'll get to them at the end. And it looks like Raquel, you are all set. Yes, so can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. So, um, yeah, thank you for inviting me to talk today about uh, the work that we are doing in the lab. Uh, Chris gave a really great introduction about obesity and the struggles that uh, it carries with it. Uh, so the interest in my lab is to better understand how uh, environmental agents contribute to transgenerational obesity and what are the mechanisms of inheritance. So as Chris mentioned, obesity is a global uh, health problem. So if we look at the uh, map of the world in terms, in terms of obesity back in the 70s, uh, you can see that uh, only around 10% of the population could be considered obese. But then uh, I'm gonna just to pull out the laser pointer so I can actually use it. But uh, if we look at the map uh, these days, uh, it has dramatically changed. So the percentage of obese population all over the world has dramatically increased. And right now, the average could be considered around 20 or 25% of the population, depending on the region. But in countries like the United States, those percentages have increased to up uh, greater than 40% of the population. So as Chris mentioned, uh, obesity uh, is a problem not only in terms of uh, the aesthetics, but uh, it also um, 
uh, carries a lot of uh, problems in terms of um, the economy, uh, is associated with other diseases like diabetes and cardiovascular disease, and um, uh, it, it also has an impact in it from the social perspective. So there is a lot of stigma around obesity. So it is very important to understand what are the factors that are contributing to obesity. We know that during adulthood, a positive energy balance uh, can contribute to obesity together with genetics, stress, gut microbiome, and infections. We also know that the environment we are exposed to during uh, in utero development may be also playing an important role later in life. So smoking or poor nutrition during pregnancy can contribute to obesity in the offspring. And we also know now that the environment our ancestors were exposed to many generations ago maybe also play an important role in obesity in current generations. And one example of that is the cohort uh, that comes from the Dutch famine studies. So the Dutch famine occurred at the end of World War II when there was a shortage in food availability in the Netherlands. And um, here in the right, what I am showing is a graph that is represented, representing in this column um, it is represented the desired amount of kilocalories that each individual so should um, intake every day. And then, uh, as you can see, during the war, there was a decrease in the amount of kilocalories that, that the population was intaking. But then at the end of 1944 and the beginning of 1945, there was a dramatic decrease in this uh, food availability. So something that is very extraordinary about this um, uh, situation, uh, about the, this population, is that there were really good records about the health uh, of these individuals that were exposed to the famine. And one particularly interesting um, cohort is uh, the pregnant women that were pregnant around this time. So something that was uh, found is that exposure to this famine during preconception or during a, a pregnancy would lead to adverse health outcomes in the offspring. So it was found that uh, the offspring had like different uh, diseases related with metabolism like uh, obesity or higher rates of diabetes and also other diseases like uh, infertility or increased adult uh, mortality. And something that I find very interesting is that right now there is uh, more information about the next generation. So these will be the grandkids of those women that were exposed to the famine many years ago. And um, it has been shown that in general, this uh, population has a worse health than individuals that whose grandparents were not exposed to famine in normal circumstances. So now the question will be, how does that happen? How is this uh, phenotype uh, passed from one generation to the next? So when we think about inheritance, we tend to think about genetics and uh, the Mendelian laws. So in this scenario, we will have an environmental perturbation that will cause one particular mutation in our DNA, and that will be reflected in one particular phenotype in the next generations. However, what we are actually seeing is something a little bit different. So we see that there is an environmental perturbation, then there is an alteration that I will talk about that in just a second, and then the number of different phenotypes or adverse health outcomes that are observed are very different. So they are related with metabolic disorders, but also for infertility, et cetera. So the mechanisms that we think are playing a role in this process are related with epigenetics. So what is epigenetics? So the term, or the concept of the idea of uh, the environment playing an important role in the expression of our genome and the development of uh, certain diseases uh, was coined for the first time back in 1950s by Conrad Waddington. And the definition of epigenetics um, has been um, changing uh, for the last decades. And right now, epigenetics refers to those alterations that lead to a stably heritable phenotype resulting from changes in a chromosome without alterations in the DNA sequence. So that means that there is not a mutation that is causing how our genome is being expressed. So there are different ways to see um, 
there are different epigenetic mechanisms described at this point, and uh, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, so if we think about our DNA, so each of our cells have DNA, and they, this DNA is very well compacted in the nucleus. So this picture is representing here a chromosome, and the chromosome is made out of chromatin that is very well compacted, and the chromatin is formed of DNA and a, a group of a, proteins called histones. So there are different chemicals, uh, chemical groups that can be added to this DNA sequence or to these histones that are going to regulate the expression of the genes that are located in the regions where these modifications are placed. For instance, one example is DNA methylation. So there is a methyl group that is um, located in one particular place in the genome and this is something that is naturally occurring and depending on where these um, uh, methyl groups are located are going to regulate how this region is being expressed and in the same way um, uh, modifications of histones uh, can also participate in uh, the regulation of the genome. So the work that I want, uh, that I have been working on for the last few years during my postdoc and what I want to continue doing as an assistant professor is related to better understanding the role of endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs in transgenerational epigenetic inheritance of metabolic disruption. So when I, when we talk about transgenerational experiments, we are uh, talking about a very complex uh, process. And I think about transgenerational studies uh, in three different phases. So the first phase will be um, the initial alteration. So we will expose to whatever environmental agent we are interested in uh, to the parents either the mother or the father, and that will cause an initial alteration in, in this parent. And then there is the process of uh, propagation across multiple generations that I refer to transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. And finally, we will have the final endpoint that will be the, the phenotype that we are looking into. And in my case, I am interested in metabolic disruption. So this F0, F1, F2, F3, and F4 represent uh, different generations, and therefore will be the great great uh, grandkids after ancestral exposure of the uh, great great grandparents. So, um, there have been a number of studies done um, with different chemicals that have shown um, that they have a, a metabolic disruptive effect uh, across multiple generations. And the list is shown here in uh, the box. Uh, and generally, we um, focus on characterizing the epigenetic mechanisms that may be explaining the phenotype that we are seeing in the uh, later generations, the F4 or the F3 generations. And when we talk about these epigenetic mechanisms, I want to bring up again DNA methylation or histone modifications. That is something that I mentioned in the previous slide, but also non coding RNAs that I didn't mention, but it's also a very known uh, mechanism regulating uh, the expression of the genome. Other uh, points that are being studied are uh, the contribution of each of the parental germlines. So um, the germline represents the oocyte in the woman and the spermatocytes in men. So uh, it is important to understand which is the parental line that is contributing to the phenotype in the offspring. However, those approaches are not actually describing the mechanisms of propagation of the phenotypes. And there is also a lot of work done in understanding what is the initial alteration caused by these environmental agents in the F0 generation. Uh, so there is information known about the modes of action and the target tissues after diet exposure. However, there is a gap in knowledge between this initial alteration in the F0 and how that translates to transgenerational um, uh, diseases. And that is one of the things that I am very interested uh, in better understanding. So the work that I have that I did during my postdoc and um, it was related to um, understanding the effect of tributyltin in this uh, multi-generational study um, uh, in terms of uh, its effect in metabolic disruption. 
So uh, Tributyl team is a biocide and uh, it is currently banned, but in the past it was present in paints that were used to paint boats. And the presence of tributyl team will prevent barnacles and uh, seaweed and microorganisms to grow in, in the boats. And uh, even though the use of tributyl team has been banned, um, it has uh, been found in seafood and house dust uh, in the last few years. And tributyl team, so that means that we are exposed to it. And um, tributyl team is known as a metabolic disruptor. So the work that I have done, I did uh, during my postdoc three uh, independent transgenerational studies uh, that uh, with the objective of better understanding the role of tributyl team in multigenerational obesity. And we consistently found that after ancestral exposure to tributyl team, the animals tended to uh, accumulate more fat. So in this particular experiment that I'm showing here, uh, what we did was to change the diet of the animals from a standard diet to a higher fat diet, and then we switched the diet back to the standard diet. And during the weeks that the animals were exposed to the um, uh, high fat diet, the animals that were ancestrally exposed to tributyl team, that are represented here in the dotted line, accumulated significantly more fat than the control animals that are represented here with this DMSO group. Um, so there is a very a strong difference between the two groups. So now the next question will be how that happens. So how do we go from having F0 pregnant females exposed to tributyl team to actually have metabolic disruption in the fourth generation? So the first thing that we did was to uh, actually look into epigenetic mechanisms. And our hypothesis was that tributyl team alters DNA methylation in certain regions of the genome that will affect how genes that are involved in metabolic processes are expressed. So to address that uh, hypothesis, we took fat tissue from the fourth generation of animals that were obese, um, and then we look into alterations in methylome and transcriptome. Methylome refers to DNA methylation analysis and transcriptome refers to uh, expression levels of the genome. So when we look into the associations between these two uh, genomic traits, we uh, didn't find any associations. So we had to reject our hypothesis. So then we move to our second hypothesis that was that tributyl team alters nuclear genome so what does this mean? Going back to this picture that I showed you a few slides uh, back, um, I mentioned that the chromatin is very well compacted in the nucleus. So to kind of uh, show you a schematic representation of that, I'm uh, using this cartoon. So here there is a cell represented and then there is the nucleus. And within the nucleus, there are all these different uh, bubbles that represent the chromosome territories. If we zoom into the bubbles, uh, we can see that um, there are two different compartments that are called compartment A and compartment B. So compartment A represents euchromatin and uh, uh, the genes that are located in these regions are actively uh, expressed. Uh, another property of compartment A is that uh, it has higher accessibility to transcri tra transcription factors, which is going to help in the uh, expression of these genes. And uh, in contrast, compartment B uh, is uh, also known as the heterochromatic compartment, and it is transcriptionally inactive, and it is less accessible to um, transcription factors. Another uh, important characteristic or, or difference between these two compartments is that compartment A is high in GC content, and compartment B is high in AT content. So this GC and AT refers to the base pairs that uh, are, uh, define the sequence of the DNA. So there are some regions that are uh, enriched in G GC base pairs, and there are regions that are enriched in AT base pairs. So the regions with high GC content are located in compartment A and contain active genes, and the regions that are uh, high and rich in AT uh, base pairs are located in compartment B and they uh, have 
transcription and the inactive genes. So there are different ways we can actually see these two different compartments. One of them is by using immunofluorescence. So uh, these two pictures are representing, representing two different cell types. In blue, you can see, uh, sorry, in green, you can see euchromatin or compartment A. And in red, you can see heterochromatin or compartment B. And uh, something that is very interesting is that you uh, can probably see that they don't overlap. So they are very, very well uh, differentiated. And another way to look into these uh, two compartments is using this technique that is called high c that allows to uh, find the frequency of interaction between different regions of the genome. And this cartoon is actually representing uh, is a, an schematic representation of how a high c uh, heat map will look like. And you can actually differentiate the different compartments there and how they don't interact with each other. So when uh, we were with our second hypothesis that stated that TBT alters nuclear genome organization, ideally we will have like to do high C. However, in order to do this kind of analysis, you need your tissues to be preserved in a very specific way. And we even have the tissues to uh, do those kind of analysis. So we looked for an alternative uh, approach so we use isocores to guide our analysis. And isocores are large regions of the genome with highly homogeneous base composition. So this brings us back to this GC80 content. So there are five different isocores that are called L1, L2, H1, H2, and H3. And they represent L1 and L2 are located in regions with low GC content or high AT content that represent heterochromatin and compartment B. And uh, H2 and H3 represent regions with a high GC content and euchromatin or compartment A. So uh, this, is a, this sentence actually reflects what I just said, that isocores reflect multiple levels of organization, euchromatin versus heterochromatin, compartment A and compartment B. So another important property of isocores is that they are invariable across tissues, generations, and sexes. So all the, um, the, the cells of our uh, body has the same sequence. And within our species, we have the same sequence, even though we have some uh, specific mutations that I'm not going to be talking about right now. And that is one of the things that makes us a little bit different. But um, it is a very important uh, factor when we want to use isocores to guide the analysis that we want to do. So the analysis that we do was to uh, do analysis of genomic traits that in this case uh, was focused on transcription, which means expression of the genome with regards to isocores before and after randomly rearranging re data sets 10,000 times. So the graph that I'm going to be showing to you, this is just a, a, an a schematic representation of the results that are coming, uh, is going to look something like this. So in the X axis, you can see the five different isocores. So, uh, and they go from L1, L2 that are AT and rich or heterochromatic regions to H2 and H3 that are GC and rich and represent euchromatic regions. So if the data, is above the zero line. This means that the genes that are located in this region, here represented as heterochromatin, uh, are overexpressed in TBT samples compared to DMSO samples, compared to the control sample. If the data is seen um, under, below the zero line, this means that the genes that are located in this region are underexpressed in TBT samples compared to control samples. And if the data is around the zero line, that means that they are no uh, significantly different um, expression uh, in genes uh, in TBT versus the control samples. So the experiment that we did was to actually take different tissues that will be fat tissue, liver, and mesenchymal stem cells that uh, if you remember, Chris talked a, a little bit about it in his presentation. And um, those tissues came from two sexes, males and females, and we analyzed transcriptome. 
So this graph is representing the results. So I don't want to go uh, a lot into detail of what this means, but basically here you can find the legend and each of the panels represent uh, a different tissue and a different generation. Uh, but what I want you to focus on is uh, using this as an example that represents uh, the fourth generation male GWAT, that is adipose tissue is that there is a bias in how the genome is being expressed. So the genes that are located in heterochromatic regions, the isocores L1 and L2, are underexpressed in TBT samples compared to control samples. And the genes that are located in um, euchromatic regions are overexpressed in TBT samples compared to uh, control samples. So this supports the hypothesis that tributyltin is actually altering nuclear genome organization in a way that is going to bias the expression of the genome. And something that is interesting is that the genes that are involved in metabolic processes tend to be say, more located, tend to be biased towards regions with high GC content that represent euchromatin. And if we go back to the previous slide, you can see that those regions in the adipose tissue are overexpressed. So that means that the um, genes involved in metabolic processes uh, are uh, potentially overexpressed in these tissues, and that can actually explain the metabolic disruption that we see in the animals. Another important factor is that the genes that are involved in chromatin organization, that is another way to say nuclear genome organization, are also biased towards regions that are euchromatic. So going back to our uh, sample, uh, in the adipose tissue, these genes are going to be overexpressed. So our hypothesis is that uh, the way this phenotype is propagated across generations is by a self-reconstructive propagation. And what does this mean? So when we expose pregnant females to tributyltin, there is going to be an alteration of the nuclear genome organization in the first generation that is going to affect the expression of genes that are both related with metabolism and chromatin organization. And then we are going to see an alteration in the metabolism of the individuals. But also the fact that the proteins related in chromatin organization are affected uh, are going to condition how the chromatin is going to be established in the next generation. So that is going to be carried uh, from one generation to the next. And that is why we think the mechanism of propagation of the phenotype is through a self-reconstructive mechanism. So uh, we have some insights about this way of propagation of uh, the effect of tributyltin. However, we don't uh, fully understand how the initial alteration that tributyltin causes in the target tissues of the F0 uh, is actually passed this transition between the direct effect and the next generation effect. There is still a knowledge gap that we are trying to uncover. And um, another important thing is that we know that there are different chemicals that contribute to transgenerational obesity. And it will be very interesting to actually know whether they are uh, doing this, uh, leading to these phenotypes following similar uh, mechanisms. So that is one of the things that we want to do in my lab. And with that, I just would like to thank uh, everybody in my lab that is slowly growing. And I don't have a picture of all of us together because of the current situation, but uh, this is the people in my lab. I have a couple of collaborators, uh, Camila from GCSC and Diana Laird from GC San Francisco. And um, yeah, we are collaborating in different projects with nicotine and um, mechanisms of uh, transgenerational inheritance. And I also want to thank uh, the Bloomberg Lab because the data that I have shown today uh, was done in the Bloomberg Lab during my postdoc and uh, it was the work, the collaborative growth uh, work with uh, many different people in, in that lab. And with that, I will be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you. Um, can can people hear me? Apparently, I wasn't. Uh, we can I was having you. trouble before. Yeah. You can, can hear me now. Yes. Great. Okay, I'm on my phone. But I, <laughs> all right. So yeah, if you have any questions for 
either speaker, you could type them into the Q&A box. Uh, we have a couple for Chris already, so I'm going to start with that. Um, so, Chris, first question, can you give a simple summary, like your elevator speech? <laughs> uh, do these chemicals in cleansers mess up the thyroid and thus make us fatter? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so, I think I, w I talked around this a little bit because uh, it's not a simple story yet, right? So we're not we're not at the end of the story, and so I can't say that these these chemicals are what is driving the effects. Uh, I'd say we we've definitely shown that mixtures of chemicals in in dust promote fat cell development, uh, and that seems to be occurring through the thyroid receptor, uh, at least in part. Um, we, we definitely think that these surfactants might be one of the main players. Um, we are further evaluating that now. Uh, and we do have some evidence that they also operate <laughs> through the receptor. Uh, so that's some additional uh, evidence that they might be, might be responsible. Okay, thank you. Um, what also, I'm gonna keep with Chris for now. And um, what would you consider the best molecular targets for screening chemicals in vitro for metabolic disrupting offense, uh, effects? Sorry. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I don't know if I have a great answer for you. I would say there's a lot of them, right? So I think that uh, historically, what we've spent the most attention on would be things like PFAR gamma and the retinoid X receptor or RXR. Um, I think there are, you know, the work that we've been doing has shown that there are a lot of other, other targets in there, right? So the glucocorticoid receptor has gotten a decent bit of attention, but things like the thyroid receptor, um, you know, pharnesoid X receptor, some of these other targets um, have really gotten limited attention so far. Uh, and so I think there are actually quite a few uh, targets. So uh, I appreciate that might not be the best answer for you, but there's a lot. Okay, and one more. Um, regarding long-chain chemicals and U-shaped dose response studies, are these long-chain chemicals expected to break down to the mid-range ones once they're in the environment or in the body and therefore be more potent? Yeah, absolutely. So these chemicals uh, do primarily degrade by uh, shortening of the ethoxylate chain. So they, they, the long-chain ones will eventually become the medium-chain ones. Uh, which had the more potent effects, uh, and they will eventually degrade down to the base chemical, the nonalphenol or the alkaphenol. Uh, and this is largely why we've shifted away from the alkaphenols, uh, as we appreciate that uh, nonalphenol and, and, and octalphenol are, are relatively well-described toxicants. Uh, and so since these uh, ethoxylates degrade to those over time, um, you know, we have started to see a shift uh, towards some alternatives like the alcohol ethoxylates. And so the, but by the same thing, the um, medium change would degrade into the shorter too, right? That's correct. Yep. They will eventually degrade okay. down to that, uh, to that base chemical. Okay. Um, Raquel, a couple questions for you. Um, yeah. One, are you... Are you seeing the effects going down the male line as well as the female line, or is it one or the other? Or so we haven't looked into that yet. I think that is a very interesting question. Uh, we don't know. We don't know uh, which uh, parent is carrying the information from one generation to the next. Um, there is some information from other groups that have looked into the male germline and they have found alterations in uh, DNA methylation in the sperm. So not working with tributyltin, but with other chemicals that lead to transgenerational obesity. So uh, it seems that uh, the male germline uh, could be a potential good candidate for the transmission of this information, but uh, there is no information about what is the role of the female uh, oocyte uh, in with that regard. And I actually think that it plays an important role, but I don't have data to prove it. And it's something that I will definitely would like to look into and it's in my plan. Hmm. Interesting. Um, are your, how are the um, doses in the study? Like, are they pretty high doses or I've, 
I think in the past, no. some of these are pretty high dose, but no. Okay. So, I, well, yeah, I, uh, no, in the case of my studies, so tri with tributyltin, we were very careful of using concentrations that are uh, in the realm of the exposure that uh, the concentrations that humans are exposed to or the information that is regarding um, TBT levels in, in blood um, in humans. Uh, so our concentrations are pretty low. Um, and we use generally three different concentrations and, uh, you know, they are always uh, in that range. Uh, but it's true that there are some of the studies that I cited in the presentation um, used other chemicals where the concentrations were very, very high. So that raised the question about what is the significance in terms of human exposure. So, um, yeah, that uh, is definitely something that we need to keep in mind when we are trying to address these kind of uh, studies to, to, to answer the questions uh, about multigenerational experiments. Mm -hmm. And I'm also wondering how much do we know about like human exposure to TBT? Like I, there seems to be not much information on that. So there is not a lot of information about that. And uh, so it has been found in seafood and house dust. I don't know if, if, if Chris has found tributyltin in any of his samples, or if, if you guys have looked into that. But uh, there is literature showing that uh, there have been, uh, they, they found tributyltin in, actually in different countries in house dust. So it seems to be prevalent in the environment. So we are exposed to it. Um, and, and yeah, the main sources of exposure are basically food and, and dust. But uh, in terms of the concentrations that are found in human tissues, there is very limited amount of information. Uh, but we know that uh, there is a, a cohort where they were studying t different organotins, um, uh, levels of different organotins, and tributyltin uh, was found in the range of 20, in the 20 nanomolar range. Uh, and the concentrations that we use in our experiments uh, are 5 nanomolar, 50 nanomolar, and 500 nanomolar via drinking water. So they are in that range of uh, the concentrations that um, can be translated in what is found in humans. Chris, do you want to address that? Have you looked for it in your I see you nodding. I'm not sure if people can see you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, unfortunately. It would be, it would be very interesting to look for, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, that is not something that we have, have measured in our lab. So Raquel, how does it get into house dust? Like, isn't it a, in the ocean? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I actually, uh, I'm, I'm, I actually don't, don't have an answer to that but it has been found in house dust. So how it transitions, so it is definitely present somewhere else. That is not the ocean, <laughs> not only the ocean, but, oh. it, uh, but uh, it is not known yeah. how, um, uh, what is actually the source of that TBT that is found in the house dust is yeah. unknown. Are there other products that use TBT that we don't know about or? Uh, well, I don't think so because it has been banned its use uh, for many purposes, so for all purpose, purposes. So I don't think that will be the case. At least uh, not um, intentionally put in, in the products. So it could be the use of a different chemical that can be metabolized uh, and then appear as tributyltin, but uh, I'm not quite sure about that. I have a real quick question for Chris. Um, when you're doing that, the kind of studies with the cell lines, what about metabolism and like, how does that fit in? Like when you're, when the body is metabolizing a chemical? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is something that we have spent some time thinking about uh, for sure. So uh, the metabolic capability of 3T3 cells has not really been well characterized. Um, so, so the question really is being, um, you know, are the chemicals, the, the parent chemicals, so the chemicals used in your products, are they the real, you know, potential health threat? Or is it really the chemicals that they break down into once they are in the, a human or an animal? 
Uh, and we definitely know that in some cases, uh, things like DHP, a phthalate, break down to MEHP, which is, is more active on metabolic uh, outcomes. Uh, so we do know that, that some of that could be the case. Uh, we opted to stick with the, the dust um, and, and not try and, you know, activate it. Uh, you know, there are assays to do that, uh, like using liver fractions uh, to, to break down your parents into more of the metabolites that you might see in the human body. Um, but that's, yeah, still something as of yet unexplored um, by us, certainly. Um, but we're, we're definitely interested in looking into that in the future. All right, and we have one more really quick question for Raquel. Does PVC pipe have any TBT in it? Yeah, I like that question. Uh, so it is not, TBT is not present in PVC pipes intentionally. So that could be one of the examples where uh, TBT is not intentionally placed there, but it can be found. Something, a work that I did also in my postdoc was related to dibutyltin, DBT. And DVT is in PVC pipes. And what we found is that exposure to pregnant uh, females uh, to um, DVT leads to metabolic disruption in the next generation. Um, so that is an important. Uh, we, we didn't follow a transgenerational uh, structure. We only focus on the first generation, but there was already a phenotype there. So it is important to, to actually keep that in mind when we think about the different uh, materials that we use in our house. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, That's, uh, I like that question. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. I think we're good. Thank you very much for your talk. And I'm going to turn this over to Hannah. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. We're approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on Shay's website soon. And tomorrow you'll receive an email containing a link to the video. The next Shea webinar is our final webinar in the Cancer and Environment series. It will take place on Wednesday, July 22nd, and is titled Disparities in Cancer. To learn more into RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to Che and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate the CHE Partnership Webinars bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via a secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speakers, Chris and Raquel, thank you so much for your time and for presenting today, and Sarah for your excellent moderation. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Stay well and healthy and have a great day. <laughs>